Raise Your Voice and Not Your Sea Level. Uh, what a title and what a scary thought. Doctor, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Doc, first, let's, let's start with just a, a, like a layman expression of uh, global warming. Uh, before you do that, at every given time, this being, you know, once upon a time there was an ice age, then it melted, and then, you know, so is it not a natural phenomenon that at some point in time the weather, you know, heats up and cools down and heats up? And is this not one of the uh, periods where it's heating up? Once again, I will thank you. And um, say, yes, um, we all know. You, you said layman, but even from the scientific point, that there are cycles within the climate system, and that uh, in some observed long periods, you have warming and you have um, cooling, so that we, we have what is known as the ice age, the mini ice age, and so on and so forth. But um, what we are experiencing in recent times is um, quite an alarming rate of warming. So in the past, if you talk about cooling, it took quite a longer period for the cooling to start and then gradually build up and then eventually win off and then go back to a warming stage. But um, in the last 20, 25 years, we've had the highest temperatures observed on our planet since um, we started recording uh, temperatures that is about 1800s. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's actually the rate and what we know scientifically that is um, convincing scientists that um, what we are seeing now, even though natural causes could be a factor, but it's actually human activity that is speeding up this process of warming. So, so when you say global warming, uh, I don't know if I say what does it mean or what are the factors, but you know, what, what is global warming? Global warming simply means that the globe, that is the earth that we live on, is becoming hotter than expected or than it used to be in the past. So mm -hmm. it's just temperatures increasing. Increasing. Yes. And this has a direct effect on the sea? Yes. It does have a direct effect on every system that we have, even, even on, on human system, roads. For example, if you ha many a times when you walk over a, a bridge, you see that the bridge is designed with some slabs. Mm -hmm. They don't mold the concrete together. The idea is that there should be a space between the formation because when the bridge is sitting there, the concrete, in the afternoon time, it expands because of tem increasing temperatures. Mm -hmm. And then in the evening time, it will cool down. So everything sort of responds to temperatures. And so if it doesn't respond positively, then we have a problem. Chopping down of trees have a big effect on, uh, on global warming, yes. uh, rain effect. In our side of the world, you know, where you know, we depend on charcoal and we depend on this, what, what then do we do? What, what we do is <laughs> simply not chop down the trees, not use the charcoal. I think that is why successive governments have tried that we will win ourselves of especially urban demand for charcoal so that we will use something like gas. Actually, this is why for a long time there were subsidies and other things on gas so that you don't, because uh, we know that if you use uh, any fossil base, uh, substance and you burn it to generate energy, then you, you put a, a substance known as carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which then builds up this temperature. So uh, nobody will encourage tree cutting, not at all. The, the, the other thing is, you know, for any program to be successful, you know, the average citizen has to buy into it, believe into it, and know that it's at my you know, detriment if I do this. But there are people who, you know, see a tree and the next thing they want is a chainsaw. They don't know whether the sea is going to rise, especially if he lives in Bronga He yes. doesn't care how much the sea rises. To him, it's never going to get here. Mm -hmm. How do we get people to buy into this, uh, appreciating this uh, phenomenon? I, I think we do so by, by doing what we are doing. It's late night, you are here, I'm here, trying to put the issues, the education. 
Because I think many a times why the people seem not to care is that we don't believe in ourselves and the power that we have. He thinks that, oh, but what about, what can I do as an individual? This single tree, if I cut it, what happens? But it's the collective action. So if we all understand it and do the little things in our corner. So, so I think that we should continue to educate ourselves and our people that the little that they do count. But I'm afraid that we haven't gotten across and people think, I can't do anything. If it is this, what can I do? But there is a lot each and everyone can do to help address the situation. How, how fast is the sea rising, if indeed it is rising? I, I, I think uh, it's, it's not necessarily how fast by the trend. It's not stopping. Normally, it, it rises inches a year, few centimeters a year. But that is enough to cause a lot of havoc. Because uh, when the sea rises, in our part, part of the world, we don't have a lot of strong winds. But in other places, when the sea level rises and a little bit more land is taken, the actual impact comes in when there is a storm surge or tidal surge. Mm -hmm. And then the end effect is it takes more land. So it's, it's gradual, but the sea is so huge that a little bit expansion takes a lot of land all over the world. What can we do? Can we slow it down or can we stop it? Um, that, that, is, that is big. I think the international community is, is trying hard to, to, because one person cannot stop it. Mm -hmm. Because the oceans are linked, the climate system is linked. And so whatever happens in Accra has a detrimental effect miles I was, away. I was, more like, I was more like human race, our yes. generation, not yes. necessarily Ghana. I mean, we're too small. I mean, but like, can how, how the whole world, I mean, if we bought into the idea, what do we do? Do we slow it down or yeah. do we stop it? What science say? Uh, what science is saying is that um, the effect uh, or the harm has already been caused. What we can do is to change our ways of development of transportation so that we limit the amount of the gases that cause this warming. But whether we do, it, we do that or not, in the short term, there is, there is practically not a fix mm -hmm. because the carbon is already in there. But the global community knows that we will need to come together, control how much carbon we put into the atmosphere and all other greenhouse gases so that the effect will not even be larger than what we are. Because earlier you talk about temperature increases. Mm. The whole global average is about one degree temperature rise. But the international community, through the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, has concluded that by, say, 2080, if we do business as usual and don't use cleaner technology, temperatures could increase on average globally by five degrees centigrade. And that means that so many ecosystems cannot respond, cannot recover. There will be a lot of devastation if the world were to increase to an average of five degrees centigrade. Doc, doc, who, who would suffer more? Those in the tropical countries, the desert, that's for them, is, for everybody, is global warming. Yes. Uh, is it those in the temperate that are going to suffer more, or...? Um, the United Nations team for today, uh, the bigger team actually was uh, small island developing states and climate change. Um, we have some countries that are very tiny. If you see the map, they are dotted all over the place. Most of those countries will be wiped out. That, that is the assessment. Mm -hmm. But in terms of uh, humanity, uh, if you go into the literature, it comes back to how well you are developed. So Africa, I'm afraid, still stand out as the continent that will most likely suffer the largest impact of climate change. But the one who argue that, well, it is our time now to develop. Yes. You know, it's our time now to pump some CO2 and fossil fuels into the air so that we also move forward. All these guys who are trumpeting up and down saying global warming, they finished building their cars and their skyscrapers. So let them go and plant the trees while we develop, and after we'll come back and plant some trees. Well, uh, it's that, that, that is... Uh 
a, a, more, very self, a very selfish position uh, to it's take. Selfish <laughs> and, and also <laughs> also the, the moral uh, question there because uh, but of course mm -hmm. you've raised an, an important question mm -hmm. because some of the earliest attempt at addressing climate change issues didn't work well. Mm -hmm. Something like the Kyoto Protocol some that that was an attempt to America control. Did not sign America to did not sign, citing the fact that you have China that mm -hmm. is has overtaken America in terms of how much they, they are pumping into the earth or emitting into mm -hmm. the atmosphere. But China is always claiming to be a developing country and for that matter doesn't have to cut. But as I said, the global system is linked. So if you don't cut, I don't want to de defend the West. Mm. But when the industrialization started about um, 1750s in the eight, uh, 18th century, the truth about the matter is that science didn't really nail it down that this will be the impact if you bend this coal and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So a lot was done. It was around 1900s. That uh, and then eventually about 1950s, that conclusively we could link emissions to warming. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it was done when the, the science allowed people to do what they did. But uh, now we know. So now that we know, can we just say, okay, we need the power. Let's do anything. So I think that the, 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 the one of the schools of thought, or what I stand for, is that you have to combine as much as possible to, so that you don't do too much of the dirty energies, I mean, the ones that mm -hmm. pollute a lot. But it's a fact. We, we don't even have the technology to use only green uh, energy or sustainable energy. So you have to balance, use a little bit of thermal, hydro, um, solar, wind, and I think that is a, a better moral option than to say, oh, they polluted, so let us also pollute. E EPA is uh, you know, giving the go-ahead for the uh, Jubilee Fields to flare gas. Uh, is, it, is flaring of gas that bad or not so bad? I mean, how much damage would they be causing? Of course. Gas, the, the, the whole discussion about uh, global warming and energy, that is when the, the gas and the, the crude oil comes in, is that if, if we all had a better way, an efficient way of using renewables, nobody will encourage uh, the use of oil and the gas associated with it and the flaring of it. But uh, the, the issue, I think, that the EPA is doing that because they understand the signs. Sometimes our emotions overtake uh, uh, lead the discussion and then we don't get because as I understand it there were some other infrastructure that was supposed to be in place so that you could pump the gas there treat it, sell it to us because we even need the gas mm -hmm. but I think, I think I'm not an EPA person, the reason why EPA will allow or will say oh okay uh, let's put, cool down the emotion for now allow people to flare is because you cannot have the, the, the infrastructure to receive the, the gas. So I believe that it's a temporary fix and, and that uh, something will be done and then... The, so one the of the reasons, I think at the moment yeah. they, they're re-injecting the gas yeah. and apparently it's affecting the it flow. Will. So it will. you know, might as well burn, yeah. uh, burn it. Yeah. And you know, I was just thinking, you know, there's you one side sure. trying to save and there's us one side yeah. mismanaging yeah. and flaring. What's the, what was the theme for this year's environment day yeah that like i said earlier the team was uh, uh, set by the united nations was uh, climate change and the uh, small island developing countries mm -hmm. or small island developing states and then coming down to ghana uh, uh the local team has been uh raise your voice uh, and not um, sea level, sea level. Yes. Uh, encouraging of tree planting yes i haven't seen a strong campaign encouraging tree planting, even though somebody called into my show today to say, look, encourage your listeners to plant a tree, yes. you know, wherever they are. Yes. I, I haven't heard or seen that campaign. Uh, is anybody championing it? Yes. <coughs> uh, some organizations that I know of are doing it. Um, for instance, uh, Green Growth Solution, that is an NGO, 
had a program. I, I didn't witness it, but at least we, they spoke about it, that today they were joining with the Ochiman Foundation mm -hmm. and were targeting um, 5,000 trees to be planted. So some individuals have, uh, and organizations have really bought into the idea and have seen the need to continue to plant more trees. I mean, well, one of your documents I was reading, and it says that, you know, 40% of the world's population live within 100 kilometers of the sea, and some of them are really low-lying. Yes. So uh, if we don't care about this thing, I mean, that's a huge task. Yeah. And people that can be affected. Uh, are we educating those people to, to you know, help in, in, in this uh, uh, menace? Uh, we, we are. But as to whether they are buying into, when, when you talk about global statistics of the people living in the coastal areas more, it's actually even the richer countries. If you go to a place like America, many of their larger cities, New York City, Miami, Boston, and so on, are all coastal locations. But I brought that in because it depends on where you are. <laughs> people, people don't even think seriously that there is a problem. They mm -hmm. see the system very efficient. It's working. But sometimes they get a hint. Uh, last year or so, there was a huge storm in the U.S. And the devastation was immense in New Jersey and so on. So those are reminders. But either than that, when a country is uh, very developed, uh, in our local palace, uh, I, I won't even go there. But if you literally translate into English, if you live well, you tend to forget what is possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they, the individuals who don't. But I think the systems and the uh, governance does see the need to do something because it's a reality. The global warming is a reality. It's not a hoax. I'm going to take a break here, and then when I come back, you know, once upon a time, you know, our forefathers and sisters were very in touch and in tune with our nature. At what point did we lose that uh, connection that's causing all this menace? Stay tuned. Raise your voice and not the sea level. I'm talking to Dr. Kojo Wusu, uh, Coordinator, Climate and Sustainable Development Program, University of Ghana. Doc, you know, once upon a time, as Ghanaians or maybe as Africans, we were very, very in touch with nature. Rivers, the sea, trees, tilling. You know, we, man and nature were in tandem. At, at what point did we lose respect for nature to you know end up like this oh it's it's it's, it's a big question but I, I think that it's our quest to detach ourselves from our own tradition and the fact that we saw everything modern from other cultures as better than ours and also to a lesser extent this is debatable but to a lesser extent the way we we police our environment and the way we, we were in tandem with our environment. Because many a times in the olden days, we also associated our forest with our ancestors and spirits mm -hmm. and so on. So if a young man, this is from my own perspective, mm -hmm. became, say, a Christian, then he began challenging the status quo. You say we can't go to this forest uh, on Wednesday, but I will prove to you that as a Christian or as another believer, if I go there, I won't die. So he goes there, he doesn't die, and he goes there, he sees a big Udum tree. <laughs> then he believes if he chops it down with a chainsaw, he won't die. So I think, I think that traditionally, the way we enforce, mm -hmm. I think our elders knew the value of the forest, but they didn't come out and tell us, it is the forest that makes it rain. And the forest protects us from erosion, from wind, so don't cut mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. But because many a times it was enforced through our custom and culture, ancestry and worship, then people began in some way challenging and they said oh yeah nothing will happen to us so we've lost it and you see because uh, almost every rural area you go today know or the elders there know that even when you're weeding you don't weed close to the water the water banks uh, almost every town will have a small summer poem or quite a big brim that whatever happens don't go there yeah. You know, so why, uh, maybe like you're saying, because of the funny stories and enlightenment, we challenged our status quo. But hasn't it taken us too long, too, to realize that, okay, hold on, even though the stories were not right, the reasoning for 
preserving it is right. It's taking us too long. Yeah. I, I, I think that uh, uh, you are right. And, and also, when we see other countries having pristine forests and having people not littering about and everything, the, the laws are there. The, the reasons that the people see it, they know it, but it also gets enforced. Mm -hmm. So, so you talk about the tradition and the people's perception that you don't read within certain uh, meters of rivers. But even on our own law, EPA laws, Ghana's law, it's against the law to, to encroach on a river up to uh, certain feet, maybe 50 feet, I think. Mm -hmm. But who enforces it? Who protects it? So I, I travel around the country and uh, I, I pass through... Uh, Tichiman, for instance, and uh, I see what the elders there have done. They, they have a designated uh, forest where, where they, they start their festivals and other things. But they haven't let it to the young people in the town. This one, we have to give it to the chiefs and people. They've gone to physically put a wall around the forest. That is how you get people not to go in there and to encroach. So I think it's, it's the, the, the will to protect what we believe in and also taking the steps to do it. But if you just leave it to the individual, in Ghana now everybody is hiding behind unemployment. I don't have a job, so I see a tree. I say if I have the right to cut it, whether the tree belongs to me or not. Mm -hmm. And so these are some of the problems. So I think that we are losing it, as you are saying, or we have already lost it. But we, the only way to come back and have our forests and to prevent people from farming in river banks is to have the desire to protect these bodies and to enforce our own laws. We don't need new laws. We don't need to preach to the people. They won't listen. We need to physically prevent them from destroying these um, forests and water bodies. I mean, as a traditional ruler, I have challenges, you know, and I declare that every tree belongs to me, you know, and therefore nobody chops a tree. But, you know, it, not even the young ones. I still have elderly citizens of Edumasa who still think that, oh, you're being too harsh. You know, I need charcoal and yeah. therefore I need to, you know, fell this tree. And I can, un I can assume, you know, other chiefs and other, you know, have the same challenges within their province where we think, look, I need to make charcoal and therefore this tree has to go. Whether it's going to bring you rain or him rain, I don't care. Yes. It's on my land. And this is a huge challenge psychological how, how do we fight this because well, i don't think programs like this would even touch such rural areas or touch such a person how, how do we challenge it I, I think we challenge it by by owning the issue so in your case and and by devoting resource and attention to the issue so so your sub chiefs you tell them if you want to cut a tree for charcoal I probably can't stop you, but the only time I'm going to probably have real difficulty with you is that when you don't plant. So for one tree you chop for charcoal, you have to have 10 trees to replace them. Because maybe I can't mm. stop you from doing it, but so that when your children come around, they may not need it for charcoal, but they can use it for another thing. But some of our young people, our elders, probably don't care about sustainable development or sustainability. So we all have beautiful children. What do we want to leave for them? The bare land? I don't know. Even the bare land, I don't think some people will allow it to be there. Where they are not supposed to even win sand, they are winning. Mm -hmm. So what do we really want to leave for our children? We, we, we have become a very carefree society, you know, uh, you go through school, not a day you spend on the park, not a day you spend on trees or on water bodies where your teacher is explaining to you the need for all these things. So by the time you grow up, you know, you, it, it, it's too late. The school is all cemented, yeah. you know, the, the paved, the weed, all the grass cemented. So uh, we, we have really, really detached ourselves. Yeah. And... You know, we have global warming here, yeah. which we don't understand. So I think you guys have got a huge uh, challenge, and I hope you have government backing in this, in this campaign. Yes, I think, uh, I think uh, uh, for our program at the university level on climate change and sustainable development, uh, the university itself, representing government, I would yeah. say it's a government institution, has really bought into it. Our, our vice chancellor, 
has decided that he will, he will really promote all aspects of uh, discipline and learning, but uh, has four thematic areas that he really wants to see uh, uh, Legon become a center of excellence in, in, in them. And one of the areas he has chosen and decided to really fund is climate change research. And in the last uh, congregation, uh, he announced that that platform is going to receive University of Ghana own internal funding, one million Ghana cities, to promote climate change uh, research mm -hmm. and education at the university. So at the higher level, we are doing it. We, we are getting the support. But like you said, who are we teaching? People come there, they are already chopped how many trees now? My students, I don't know. <laughs> but they are old enough. They are businessmen. They are Ghanaian adults, especially graduate mm -hmm. level. So I think the education, uh, environmental education, is lost in our curricula, should be rekindled. And then we go back to the primary school, teach these kids, as you said, the importance of having trees, having rivers running, having animals, biodiversity. But if you don't, then you, if you don't have a foundation, and then you build a beautiful house, it's going to be difficult. So I think as a nation, we need to re-examine our environmental education but how do you educate a child about environment when he doesn't even have a space to play? Mm. I think we have so many suburbs and neighborhoods that don't have a park mm. in this country. So we need to rethink. I, I, I think we are thinking too big in terms of development, cars and planes and ships and electricity and everything. But the little things, where are they? Can't a country like Ghana afford a park for kids to play? in any town or suburb of a city? Just four plots. Just four plots, as you are saying. Yes. No, you see, my mom, mom comes from a Kropong. So as a child, you know, driving all through EB, up the hill, today I drive there and there's not a single tree. Shrubs, yes, yeah. but not any big oak or, you know, big substantial tree, not one in the whole of the area and then you climb up to a Brie Pediasi and then you look at the Accra Plains and still no tree and I, I think it's a very frightening scenario there's no tree it's just green shrubs yes. and no tree and it's a frightening scenario I mean is there any body maybe forestry that's supposed to make sure some trees are saved or something because for such an area not to have one tree in a tropical country is, is uh, strange I, I, I think that I, I want to it by starting from the fact that adding to what the, the narrative you made, the sad part of it is that when I see a bigger neem tree in Accra, I feel very sad because we have created a situation to believe that probably trees cannot be sustained on the Accra plains. Because you don't see any tree. You talk about the a bruise site. Yeah. What about going towards a Sogakope, or left, right, Tema area? You don't see any tree. But the fact that in our neighborhoods, big neem trees can stand there means that the land can really support trees. So either somebody has removed the trees or what has happened. But the point is that where is forestry going to plant the tree? Who owns the land? So if you don't have the land, you can't control what is on it. Where are we going to plant the tree? You plant the tree and somebody is also selling the place for development. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, uh, the solution is, is, is bigger. We need to first acquire some. We need to. But, but of course, then, I don't even know because I don't go through it and I don't see. Is Achimota to a forest or shrub as well? Or shrubs. Uh, that, that's the shrubs. point. So successive mm -hmm. governments, if we, we saw, I, I'm sure when Achimota forest was, uh, the idea was conceived, that was a suburb of Accra. So the new Accra will expand there. Let's get a green belt around it. So when Accra is now bigger than that time, two times, where is the next Achimota forest? We haven't thought of it. We haven't? Yeah, so, so these are the issues. So unless we want to do it, because the individual land, you can't. So maybe government, maybe private person have to acquire large tracts of land and be happy to turn it into forest. I said private person because... Um, since the white man gave us a brief forest, we didn't see that we needed another forest. But I, I don't know the story, too. I've been to the site. I've seen that the, I think the CEO of the 
the uh, the company that does uh, fried rice in Ghana. A papaya. Papaya yeah. CEO has bought some huge land and and then a private, uh, you know, like a garden mm -hmm. or park, the type of their mm -hmm. breed. Mm -hmm. So. So I think private people can come in, in that manner. But unless we make a conscious effort, you can't just pick a tree and decide to plant because we don't have trees. You don't have the land, you can plant a tree on it. I'm going to take a break here and find out. Maybe, just as Doctor is saying, if we promote and see the value in ecotourism that people will actually come and pay just to walk in your garden, maybe it might encourage us to shift uh, that direction. Stay tuned, we come straight back. Raise your voice and not the sea level, a reality of our time. And we're just trying, I was talking to Dr. We're just trying to find out how you get people interested in the greenery and nature again. And ecotourism is now very big where people are paying lots and lots of money to you know, basically go and look at canopies of trees and walk on them and climb them. Maybe if we introduce that type you know, business, people might want to go in and then grow and present you know preserve trees yes i i i believe it, i believe so because uh, i think that uh, climate change presents a lot of opportunity to individuals to organizations as well so if if because of climate change also because we, we are not having the forest because uh, the trees burn and uh, they don't grow because sometimes you don't even have the <laughs> rain. The burning trees, something come to mind. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, so I think that if businesses were to see what we are preaching, talking about, and probably buy some tracts of land and develop it, bring some exotic trees and develop it into recreational, which will also serve dual purpose because then the trees will be helping the environment we're storing the carbon and so on. Yes, I believe we can benefit from it. So as we are saying, it's, it's sometimes not only government that can bring up solutions, but um, private sector oriented solutions could also work, as we were discussing mm -hmm. earlier, the private uh, gardens mm -hmm. idea. So I think it, it is a concept that can work. I mean, <coughs> the subject of park, I mean, uh, if we're Sutherland of blessed memory, apparently many, many years ago, you know, was insisting that government makes it a policy that every area should have a park, like if was the Lund Park. And, you know, back then they think they thought, you know, she might be drunk to even think, make that suggestion. There is something about greenery that doesn't make people sane. I don't know whether it's me or if it's a, if it's a true observation of that, but there's something about green or people who live closer to green area, they're more sort of yeah. saner than people who live in the concrete jungle. Yes. Of course, because uh, if you live in the, the concrete jungle, you're already stressed. In our line of duty, there is something called urban heat islands. Oh, your environment is different. When you live in a concrete jungle, elsewhere, where there are really temperature differences, temperature can vary in terms of uh, degree Fahrenheit, about five degrees different between a, uh, a concrete jungle or its inner cities. And, and forested suburbs of the mm -hmm. of the city, so temperature differences. So if you are cooler, the air is fresher and and is, is stronger than the, the concrete jungle. You you will be more seen and you have a better life. And so people around you, everybody has a good feeling. So I, I think it's important. And and, and the uh, if we are Sunderland's idea, I think was big. But you see, our politics has gotten to. A point that when you bring simple solutions and not bigger things, uh, you, even your own constituents will not buy in. He became president or minister, and all he could do is to plant trees. Uh, so I think that's why maybe sometimes it doesn't get the traction. But uh, individuals should take it up. Private sector, as we are talking mm -hmm. about, can help. I mean, I believe that. If somebody were to buy uh, four plots of land, ten plots of land, and devoted it to a park, private, uh, it, the idea is coming up. In East Legon, in Dansoma, mm -hmm. we see all these things coming up. But there, they can't even afford the bigger lands. It's very mm -hmm. expensive. No. But, but in the smaller towns across Ghana, I, I think that if people were to help to come in and to develop lands as, as uh, ecotourist sites, I think it will fetch some revenue. 
are there any you know NGO aids you know normally you know these international guys who uh, you know put a lot of carbon dioxide you know have to normally pay for somebody to you know put more oxygen to balance the equation are there opportunities that you know the state should be looking at uh, in terms of opportunities yes fantastic opportunities but uh, at the international levels nowadays uh, they don't want to saddle government so much and then the government has so many other demands and bills to pay so maybe the money comes for a it could go to b because it has to mm -hmm. if hospitals don't have medicine why are you going to plant trees so the global fund and some of the monies available cannot go to governments actually it, it, government can support private uh, companies in in their respective countries to tap into those resources but the way it works is that um, you need to develop an innovative idea of what the money will be used for mm -hmm. what tree are you planting is it a tree that can store carbon how do you protect the trees uh, have you done all the necessary things to own the land is somebody not coming in to remove it because of litigation and all that so I think globally, governments are supporting their companies to design products. And earlier in the day, I was saying that in Ghana, there was a big one that was in the pipeline where the government was working hand in hand with Zoom Lion, for instance, to mm -hmm. develop a, a, one of those programs to do a, a methane capture and, and so on. So, so the opportunities are there, but you need a sound business uh, plan for the international community to really buy in. Are there any government institution, maybe forestry or something, helping individuals so that maybe somebody has got a parcel of land somewhere and think, look, I can put mahogany on this land. Uh, what, how do I go about it? Is there, you know, a way to go about it? Uh, yes, a lot of the government's function, as I understand it, in terms of climate and uh, uh, climate, goes through the Ministry of Environment and. Uh, they have also designated EPA many a times for a lot of these climate change initiatives. Mm -hmm. So yes, uh, even as I, I, I speak, I think a Ministry of Environment in, in co collaboration with uh, the EPA and the Ghana Chamber of Commerce is putting an investor guide together so that investors can look at where the opportunities are. So if you are a business out there, and you really want to tap into this. I think the government agency or a body you need to be speaking to is the, the EPA. Okay. Now, how uh, bad is our environmental damage? I mean, the average is it bad in terms of trees we're losing, in terms of rivers we're losing. What's the state of Ghana now? Of course it's bad. It's, 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 it's serious. And that's what I would say. Yeah. But, but what I, I have always grown up to believe is human ingenuity, that uh, if we put ourselves together, we can clean it up. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that to encourage anybody to continue polluting, but at the other countries that have developed, Western Europe, uh, North America, suffered a lot of environmental damage. But when they put in the laws to stop the damage and to begin to clean up, you go to the west nowadays and many places are greener and reforested in, in Poland and other places. Biodiversity is returning. Some wild animals they thought were extinct are reappearing. Mm -hmm. So the human brain is probably the most powerful thing on, on planet Earth that, that we have. So we, if we believe in ourselves, we can reverse the damage. But, but even... The, the, the sad part is that we, we haven't reached the apex of the destruction mm -hmm. to, to even talk about is it bad enough. We are continuing to do more damage to our environment. So that is what alarms me. But uh, we can do something about it if we, we put our minds to it. I mean, Haiti was once you know, a good green vegetation and now you know, they've reversed. To, I mean, can we get there or that's too extreme? Not at all. It's not too extreme because uh, some of this environmental degradation is a mixture of human-induced and environmental factors. Do you remember 1983? Mm -hmm. Yes. So if we keep going the way we are going and we get half one year that is half worse like 1983, we may not recover. In 1983, a student wrote a document and said, our agriculture is resilient, and in 1983, and all this was then, he said, we were not resilient. We were lucky that 83 was not followed on by another worse year. 
Actually, 84, the rains were good. We had a lot of food. And 83, food aid came in. Else, we would have done worse than we did. Mm -hmm. You remember what people did? I mean, 83 was, was horrible. Survival so, of the so, so the hazy <laughs> things and all that can happen. Not when we have good rains and good years. But the way we are putting everything, digging everywhere, if we had a bad year in terms of rain and things like that, we can really mimic some of the bad examples of environmental degradation. Doctor, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Kojo, who's a coordinator, climate and uh, sustainable development program uh, coordinator in the uh, University of Ghana. But folks, try and plant a tree at least in front of your house, wherever you are, whatever space you are, put a mango tree, an almond tree, something, and play your part for our environment. And as I say, thanks for watching. Tomorrow we'll be back to do it all over again.